maintenance, easy gardening, um, you know, and give you colour all the way through the year. Um, oh, there you are. We're here for the May's edition of Green Fingertips, and Mark Smith was here with me, and we're just discussing the uh, small garden uh, plants that you can get for, you, for people who want to uh, start small gardens. Yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, the most typical garden now is a, a small garden. I know this myself uh, at home. Uh, I've got a very, very small garden, very frustrating getting just the right shrubs to fit my garden. Okay. Um, so you have to go down the route of uh, a smaller growing uh, shrub. Um, the, I mean, the, the, to start off with, the, the best way is uh, to draw a very, very simple plan uh, with rough dimensions. Um, don't um, go into the habit of just going out to um, coming out to Swarkson and uh, and just picking anything, yeah. you know. Plan it out, plan it out, because then you won't waste your money and uh, and and, uh, and do a, a really poor job. Um, sketch out a little bit of a drawing, bring it along. We can have a look at it with the, like I say, with your dimensions, because then your dimensions you can get a rough idea of how many uh, plants you need. Um, okay. For um, for a small garden. Nothing over, say, five, six foot. You know, um, traditionally a you know a six foot fence panel, something like that. Nothing over that. Everything smaller than that is ideal for a, a small garden. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, uh, just most of those tend tend to be uh, of a very narrow, compact growth, so uh, suitable for a garden. And that includes also things like climbers, uh, small trees you can have. Uh, but the uh, the selection that we've got today. Day is just generally bushy shrubs that will give you all year round colour. Okay. Um, with um, with it having a, a smaller garden like myself, uh, you have to be very, very cunning really because uh, with a, a larger garden you can get away with putting a few shrubs in that get a little bit bigger and maybe flower for a couple of uh, weeks and then they're over and then you don't see them again and they can get lost in a big garden. But with a smaller garden it's quite tricky. So okay. you're trying to get value for more. Okay, so what size would you class as a small garden? Well, only going from personal experience, my garden's 40 foot long uh, and uh, I think that's a small garden. Uh, I thought it was about 20 foot, but it's, when I measured it, it was 40 foot long and only uh, 12 foot wide, so quite a narrow garden. Um, most of the shrubs that I've got uh, sort of grow three to four feet, so you can't get many uh, shrubs in a uh, garden that wide um, before you, you get in a bit uh, tight. So you've got to be very, very cunning. Uh, when you come along and you have a look at the shrubs, a lot, all the shrubs do have dimensions on, you know, the height and the width, and it's important to take both of those. Uh, into consideration when you when you're picking the shrubs okay. um, but I would mix the heights don't try and always go for two to three feet because you can see a lot of uh, fence there I would mix it up a little bit and have something a little bit taller a little bit shorter you know and it'll just give you a little bit of added interest so what sort of things have we got to start off with a small garden well um the shrubs that, um, that, like I say, you've got to uh, be very, very cunning and uh, make sure you, you're getting your value for money in your shrubs. Something that's going to give you foliage colour all the way through the year, and as well as uh, as, as well as plants. I mean, uh, to start off with, uh, it's it's sometimes grown um, classed as a. A small tree, but this is a Japanese maple. Uh, this one's Orange Dream, and the reason I, I particularly like this variety is because it's got the the orangey uh, tips to it that fade back into the uh, pure yellow uh, leaf. And you actually, even though it it does drop its leaf in autumn and winter, you get this throughout the year. So you're getting that gorgeous colour throughout the year. It's a very d uh, delicate looking plant. But it's very hardy. People uh, think that uh, Japanese maples are, are very tender and you need to wrap them up with plastic or fleece. It's not true at all. They're very, very hardy. The harsh winter that we had two years ago, I never wrapped any of my metisas up in my own garden at all. Um, they're very, very tough. So long as you keep them really, really well drained in the pot. Because the other flip side of, of having a small garden is, like myself, I have a, a flip between. Uh, plants that are actually in the ground but also container grown plants right. um, so you can have container gone as well and these do very very well in in containers uh, another example of uh, Japanese maple here um, Benny Meko um, a beautiful beautiful pinky red uh, foliage very vibrant um, almost like electric uh, looking it's uh, incredible color 
but as you can see, um, if you compare it with some of the other foliage uh, we've got, if you plant that with another another maple for instance they complement each other very very nicely and uh, you, the contrast right the way throughout the year but also if you planted that next to a green leaf plant it would make the green leaf plant look very vibrant and also again in its own right the uh, the ace would look uh, stunning as well but they're more sort of foliage plants a little bit taller grown these are sort of six to seven foot tall right uh, and like I say ideal in a container Okay, so what sort of sunlight and uh, watering do to, to these need? Well, the, these, um, to keep the colour, they need a uh, full sun position. They can go in the uh, semi-shade, but for the best colour, uh, for the lighter leaf ones, they, they really do need the full sun. The only problem with that is if we do have a very hot summer, it can scorch the leaves. It'll only scorch the leaves, though, uh, if you keep the uh, plants really, really moist, pl plenty of water, keep the leaf nice and plump and you'll never ever get scorched. Uh, and uh, it's quite difficult when they're in pots because they tend to dry out quite easily. So you've really got to check on the watering every day it, and it's very uh, warm, sort of sometimes twice a day. So, uh, but I've got about five or six of Japanese maples at home and uh, they're very, very low maintenance. I don't have any problems with them. And like I say, if you just keep the water in, they're fine. They're uh, a very easy shrub to uh, look after. Okay. Um, smaller growing shrubs. Uh, this is a, a nice plant. This is a Japanese flowering cherry, a bush cherry. Uh, this will only get to three to four feet. Uh, again, ideal in containers, uh, very easy to look after. All the uh, flowers actually start to form before the foliage uh, comes out, and then you start to get the lush green uh, foliage on the plant uh, shortly after the flowers are finished. Um, it does have a, a good autumn leaf colour as well, very fiery, very orangey red autumn leaf colour. And it stays very, very compact, so you don't have to prune it at all. Uh, and in winter, actually, because we've had some snow this last winter, when you actually see the snow on the branches, it looks quite architectural. Yeah, it's very, uh, very attractive shrub. And likewise, we, we mentioned hebes yes. uh, last uh, month. Um, but they are a very versatile shrub, uh, evergreen, low maintenance, really don't take any pruning at all and they come in a, such a variety of colours. Uh, again, you can uh, have these in a container. Um, because the, these particular varieties have got foliage colour, you get this lovely foliage right the way through the year. You're not waiting for a flower. Um, it looks good. It, it complements regular green leaf plants uh, again. Uh, so very, um, I would always recommend having a, a Hebe in a garden uh, just for ease of gardening. Um, right. Other, other foliage plants, this is a new variety of uh, Euonymus called uh, Goldie, uh, evergreen, so you've got that lovely bright yellow uh, throughout the winter, uh, very compact growth, ideal for a container, doesn't have a flower but you're really buying that for its foliage, if you've got a very dark corner in the garden, plant that uh, in that and it will just really really brighten up the, uh, that area. Okay. Um, if you was to plant uh, the Euonymus, you could plant a uh, Fitinia Little Robin uh, next to it. There is big uh, uh, Fitinia uh, Red Robin, but this is Little Robin, which will only get to three to four feet. You could plant that next to the Euonymus, again, because of the foliage contrast. Um, this does have a flower, but you're really buying it for its foliage again. And, uh, you know, planting that next to the Euonymus, they really complement each other uh, quite nicely. Um, uh, again, another Euonymus is uh, Euonymus perilino. It's an unusual new variety where all the, uh, the new tips are this pure white. So as it's growing, all the uh, new growth is pure white. Again, very, very compact. It does great in a container and you don't have to prune it at all. That's what it's really all about, is keeping the maintenance down yep. um, and uh, not having to do uh, much gardening at all. I've so, noticed with most of these um, plants, you've got all this chip bark. Is that is that essential for every single one of these? Not essential. It, it, a lot of it is just for decoration. But the great thing about uh, having the chip bark on the plants, it actually keeps the weeds down. Right. Uh, you're not having to weed all the time. It keeps the moisture in if we have a very, very hot summer. And likewise, like the winter that we've just had, it actually keeps the frost out of the soil as well. It acts as a barrier uh, for frost. So there's quite a few different uses uh, why we have uh, the bark on the uh, plants but usually when you buy them at, at this stage it's more of a 
a decorative thing rather than uh, rather than anything else. Um, a lot of the plants that I, I've, I've mentioned so far are for, are for foliage colours, uh, and people do want flowers. And uh, a lot of the ones that will give you a lot of flower colour uh, throughout the summer uh, from now on in. This things like the. Um, Arisimum. I mean, this is a, a winter flower in uh, everlasting wallflower, uh, but this is a new variety called winter orchid, which is extremely tough. Flowers from uh, the middle uh, end of February right the way through to uh, July, August time. So again, talking about value for money, it really does give you value for money. Lots and lots of flower uh, throughout the year. Uh, Arabis there. As you can tell uh, by the way the plant's growing, it's very compact, it's cushion forming, so very, very neat. Some arabis can get quite um, tall, but this is a, a dwarf growing variety. Very, very pretty, and it just keeps on sending flowers up uh, throughout the uh, spring and, uh, and summer. Um, uh, these are they, a lot. The the plants that I've just shown, the Arisium and the uh, Arabis, are herbaceous perennials. They're classed as herbaceous perennials. And likewise, this is uh, Heliborus ivory prince, uh, which is another uh, herbaceous perennial. Now, her herbaceous perennials are very, very um, useful in, in a garden because they do get provided with lots of flower colour. Okay. And whereas you you would buy a foliage uh, evergreen plant to give you that colour throughout the year, uh, you would buy herbaceous perennials just to give you that burst of colour and they start to flower about the end of spring right the way through to very very late uh, autumn so uh, pick carefully again I would visit uh, uh, Swarks and Nursery several times a year um, don't try and do it all in one go um, you know the, the, if you've got a, a big budget it doesn't really matter. If you if you come visit several times a year, you get spring colour early on, you get summer colour, you get autumn colour, and then you mm -hmm. get winter colour. Don't be tempted to try and do it all in one go, because a lot of the things that are in at any one particular time look great at that particular moment, but if you come and buy two or three plants here, there, and everywhere, uh, there, uh, you know, get a foliage one, get a flowering plant, and then visit again, say, end of June, end of July, then you, there's a whole range of new uh, plants that you wouldn't have seen at any other time of the year, and then you can plant those then when they're looking fantastic. So that's giving you uh, foliage and flower colour right the way through the year, if you pick carefully and visit several times of the year. I'm, interest, I'm interested in this one here. This this one here. This looks really nice with the red sort of. Yeah, I mean this is a, this is a gorgeous dianthus. Uh, it can be used as a, a cut flower. This is dianthus passion. And now, if you again with a small garden, it's nice to try and introduce other things. And this is centered. It's got like a clove scent to it. Um, it flowers prolifically, so it makes you look like a very good gardener. <laughs> it's a very easy plant to grow. Um, but the scent is gorgeous, like I say, um, it's, it can be grown in a container, it's evergreen, doesn't fail on you. There's several different colours. Uh, we've got uh, from, um, Memories, which is pure white, and we've got the Passion, which is the red. Um, but it's nice to introduce a bit of scent into the garden, and not need, just flower. Sorry, do they need direct sunlight as well? They do. Um, they need plenty of sunlight to get more flower. If you have this in a shady area or a shady part of the garden, it would simply grow okay, but you wouldn't get the flower spikes up so you would need uh, plenty of sunlight uh, not so much heat but more sunlight just to try and encourage uh, flower buds to and form they are coming very nicely as well aren't they yeah that's been in flower since uh, the very very first week of february so uh, it that will give us uh, continuous uh, color right up to probably the beginning of september so again value for money there uh, the ones next to it uh, are scabious now scabious are a personal favorite of mine a little bit like the uh, the dianthus uh, there. These have been in flower since uh, February in all that very, very cold weather yeah. and it's never harmed them at all. Uh, very, very pretty plant. Likes being picked uh, because that encourages new flower buds and also is um, attractive to bees and butterflies. Right. And this will carry on flowering until um, the middle, end of August. And uh, th when you have these in your garden and they've formed and they've generated a very, well, a bigger plant because these will get to about a foot wide and a foot tall 
the amount of bees and butterflies it comes into the garden is absolutely incredible and again, again that's another feature introducing wildlife into the garden it's uh, it's not just all about the plants again it's nice to see birds it's nice to see butterflies and bees mm. and it's very important to try and encourage bees into the garden um, another scented plant which is uh, one that everybody's heard of is lavender now I know uh, this hasn't quite come into flower yet but the flower buds are forming but lavender you've got the, um, the scent of the foliage uh, and again you've got ever, everlasting flowers you know from uh, uh, middle to end of May right the way up to end of October November time normally uh, you can use those as a cut flower but lavender is, is great great uh, container plant loves full sun though it's got to be in a sunny position yeah. It is a Mediterranean plant. Um, this is Angustifolia, uh, which is like an English lavender, but you can get the French lavenders, it's got a slightly different scent to them. But again, attract uh, bees and butterflies into the garden, so uh, a lovely, lovely plant to have. Unusual because of the silver right. foliage yes. as well. Um, nice. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's nice, it complements against uh, other um, darker green leafed uh, plants. If you wanted to go, because a lot of the, the flowering plants are very, almost like a cottage garden effect, and a lot of um, uh, people that are buying houses now, which are modern gardens with the small gardens, probably want a more modern looking garden. And you can do that, you can achieve that by uh, having either the Japanese maples in very, very ornate, modern looking pots. This is Astilia. Um, now, still is uh, one of, uh, it clusters almost a, an ornamental grass. Uh, it's not really a grass, but it's clusters a, as a grass. Uh, when the summer um, and the heat, um, and it's very, very hot, all the leaves go a pure silver, which is quite unusual, really. But it shimmers, it almost looks like it's made of metal. Uh, and that's really mainly for the architectural values of these uh, curving leaves. Uh, it forms a clump, again, ideal for a container, uh, but also that shimmery uh, silver shine. Uh, very, very modern plant. And there are other plants like formium and ornamental grasses that you could plant in amongst these and palms and things like that to give the same sort of feel. Um, I wouldn't plant something like that with the flowering plants because it just wouldn't go together. Okay. So you either go for a flowering type of garden or a sort of minimalist modern looking garden um, with things like topiary box and bays and things like that but uh, that's a, a beautiful shrub and again very very low maintenance uh, and for a beginner like myself yeah um, starting a small garden would you recommend this to me as a to start a small garden yeah I, I easy would, manageable plants. yeah i would definitely I, I wouldn't go into the deep end and, and pick um something that's very very hard to grow because uh from you know a personal i hear it from uh, customers all the time where they've tried certain plants i mean japanese maples are one of those uh where people have tried them and have died on them for whatever reason and uh, people sort of oh, I don't, don't really not interested in gardening mm. if, if they're not very successful they won't carry it on but I would always try something like a hebe or a lavender or any of the herbaceous perennials are very very easy you plant them leave them forget about them there's no maintenance you don't have to keep going out to them every day and checking on them you just leave them and uh, leave them to their own devices basically and uh, yeah try easy plants to start off with then once you think oh that's that's quite good that grew very very well i must have green fingers um <laughs> you uh, then you move on to something else you know and you will over time you'll you'll develop uh, this uh, knowledge you know of uh, of plants and horticulture and uh, you you'll want to try other things you know and um the, the, there's many, many shrubs out there that are very, very easy to grow, and there's very, very few that are hard to grow. Right. So, um, with if you actually come in uh, to Swalkston and uh, and ask advice, you know, people will say, "Oh, have you got anything easy to grow?" I'm not really much a gardener, and we always point them out to hebes and things like that, and you do get a a, a great effect and uh, and lots of flower, and uh, and then you see the same customers coming back and then choosing something else, and then move on, and it is all on in stages, definitely. Um, also, um, a very, very new shrub um, this uh, this last year. A little bit like a Japanese maple, but incredibly tough, uh, very um, hard to kill. Uh, so if you if you want to start out with something, but it's nice because this fine cut foliage and. 
And unusually, um, this is called a Mahonia soft caress, and normally Mahonia is a very, very thorny leaf, and not a particularly nice, friendly plant to have in the garden. No. Uh, but this is beautiful. It's it's so unusual because of the cut leaf. I actually believe this will take over from regular Mahonia that people know as the choice Mahonia to get, because uh, you, once you've seen this, and once you see the, f the fine cut leaf and the elegant uh, nature of it, you wouldn't really go back to a regular Mahonia, because uh, uh, Mahonias are just so thorny and just anti-gardeners. Uh, you, you come out with cuts uh, when you go anywhere near them. So this is an I was attribute. Just, I was just going to say, you know, it's not just on the side, but on the edge, they've got very sharp tips. Yeah, that's yeah. right. But this is this is uh, this is really beautiful, and it's evergreen as well. Like the Japanese maple, which is cut leaf. This is cut leaf, but it's it's evergreen, and you'll have that right the way through the winter. It is actually winter flowering. It has a, a small uh, yellow flower that's very very strongly centered. Now, if you if you're part of um, the the grow your own uh, band of people that uh, that's very very popular at the moment. Mm -hmm. You can actually introduce uh, fruit and uh, into your garden, and they look like a, a regular sort of ornamental shrub. And the the great example of these is this is actually a, a dwarf fruiting peach. Uh, this is a, a nano, which actually will get no higher than, say, three to four feet. So when you come to pick, uh, you, uh, it's very easy to pick because regular peaches will get to 15 to 18 feet. Um, but it's very, very, they're only waist height when you're picking them. And it forms uh, full-size peaches. You know, right. and uh, so long as you have them in a very sunny position, in a well-drained uh, compost, the fruit prolifically and they're very, very easy to grow. And people are, are shocked that you can actually grow peaches in this country. Uh, but it's, uh, it, so long as you've got it in south facing position, they do very, very well and they're absolutely gorgeous. Nothing like getting a peach, a, a, a ripe peach, off the tree and taking a bite no, there and then. Sound, it must taste lovely. Yeah, it is. And the, the reason I put this in is because it is quite ornamental as well. The flowers are absolutely gorgeous and you get the flowers before the foliage and uh, you get a really full effect and you could have that as an ornamental tree in its own right, but the bo added bonus is you're getting the fruit as well. Okay, we moved over to plant of the month and Mark, these look absolutely stunning. They blew me away by the brightness of them. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what are they? This is uh, Pyrrhus and it's just generally Pyrrhus. Oh, hello Amanda. Hi there Mark, these look absolutely stunning. I'm yeah. interested to know, can I grow them in, in patio pots or do they need to go in a border? Absolutely, I mean we've been talking about plants for a small garden uh, and these are typically one of those plants that is ideal for a, a, a small garden or in a patio container. Uh, this is Pyrrhus and there's various uh, different varieties here. Uh, we've got the mountain fire, we've got the carnival, we've got the flaming silver and the beauty about this is we've been talking also about value for money and the uh, the great thing about Pyrrhus is all this bright red new growth is the new growth so throughout the year it's like flowers isn't it? It, it is it is people actually mistake that for a, a flower a bit like and a brack like a flowers, is. flowers as well I see. it flowers as well it's got the uh, the winter flower still on there which is uh, a bit, little bit like with lily of the valley um, but it still retains those Beautiful. flowers and then you have the, the new growth uh, right the way through the year as it's growing. So it's really, really s such a showy plant. Does it, does it need special conditions? Um, the only thing it uh, it requires really is, is an acid compost. If you're going to have it in a container, uh, you ne really need ericaceous compost or an acid compost. Yeah. Um, and um, it it, nice, it likes to be sort of up against a wall or a little bit of shade because it doesn't like cold winds, I suppose, because it, it could scorch the uh, the new growth, but you only really get that at the beginning of the year. Okay. Um, what, what would you plant that with? I mean, what, you know, how would you make that? Um, basically Basically, uh, you, because it's a nice, bright, vibrant uh, red, any darker foliage plants that uh, that, are, uh, that are already there, or uh, a nice yellow uh, foliage oh, plant yes. uh, that will complement. Because at the times where you don't have uh, the new red growth coming through, uh, the dark green foliage would uh, complement a, uh, a, a light uh, yellow, um, things like Sorberia or a, a, a Sambucus uh, or something like that to yeah. be absolutely gorgeous yeah. or even ch uh, choices sundance which is another uh, oh, evergreen yes. uh, shrub so uh, 
a fabulous, um, fabulous um, evergreen shrub, and I, I really do recommend this as plant of the month. Okay, Amanda's had to go now, so we've moved over to jobs of the month with Mark, and uh, what have we got uh, for this month? Basically, there's, there's still a um, chance of uh, late frost, which can be a bit of a problem uh, when you've uh, just sown seedlings. So we've got some seedlings here, um, just shelter those in a, in a cloche or a heated greenhouse or something like that. Um, and also, likewise, for tender plants, you can put a bit of fleece uh, around those uh, uh, to protect those from, like I say, from any late frost. Just keep an eye on the weather, uh, okay. see what they're saying that it's going to do uh, overnight. Uh, the other thing that uh, you ought to be looking out for, now the weather's uh, getting a lot more warmer, uh, and especially if you've got a greenhouse or something like that, is uh, signs for pests and diseases. Things like aphid and whitefly and, and mildew uh, can start to uh, develop once uh, the weather gets uh, a little bit milder very very easy fix um, like these uh, two uh, sprays here uh, fungus fighter for things like your mildew black spot anything like that this is a systemic one which basically you spray on very liberally all over the plants and it sinks into the plants and uh, cures the, uh, the the problem uh, very very easy fix this is ready uh, mixed so you don't have to uh, measure out any doses or anything like that very very easy and uh, the other one is all your problems like um, uh, white fly, green fly, thrips, uh, caterpillars. Again, once it starts to get a little bit warmer, these will start appearing. Like the uh, fungus fighter, you spray this on liberally, it sinks into the plant and it works its way around the whole uh, system of the plant. So you don't need to get the undersides of the leaves, uh, just spray it on uh, wherever you see leaf, it works all the way through. Once the uh, insect starts chewing into the plant, it'll kill it immediately. And the great thing about the uh, Ultimate Bull Killer, it's safe to use on fruit and veg as well, uh -huh. um, so, uh, as well as ornamental. So that's a great... Um, 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 easy, easy fix, ready uh, to use again. And because we are in uh, May, uh, traditionally this time of year, you would uh, plant all your summer uh, baskets up. Uh, like I say, there is a chance of frost, so you might need to uh, shelter them if you are planting baskets up with all your summer bedding. Uh, and you need to probably watch towards the uh, end of the month for mm -hmm. planting uh, bedding out in the garden. But uh, just keep a check on the, uh, the weather when you are um, planting out all your, your summer baskets and your e-containers. And just for one more thing, yeah. For, for, I don't understand what mildew is. Could you explain what mildew actually uh, mildew is? Mildew is a fungus, uh, right. basically, that forms on, on the leaves of plants. You've got powdery mildew and downy mildew. Powdery mildew is normally the one that you see on the top, and it's normally an environmental thing. It's normally very, very damp weather with a bit of humidity that, uh, that forms uh, mildew. And, and is it harmful? It can kill the plant eventually, left unchecked. Uh, basically, if you get mildew over the surface of the leaf and it can't focus, to synthesize then the plant will eventually die but that's in extreme circumstances it just looks very very unsightly because it, it is basically a gray mold mm -hmm. and uh, you'd get rid of it because it looks more unsightly than anything else okay so thanks for that informative uh, talk today uh, if people want to get in touch with you in in the near future how do they uh, go about that well they can contact us in the in the normal way which is uh, Derby 01332700800 which is at our phone number or if they want to contact us via email it's info at Swarks Nursery remembering the E in Swarkston uh, swarkston.co.uk uh, or we've got our website which is www.gonecenterderby.co.uk uh, and we've also got a Facebook page which is simply search uh, Swarkston Nursery and they'll find us that way. Remembering in the Ian Swarkston. Remembering the Ian Swarkston. The power of technology. Indeed.